revealed in upcoming episodes of this program are the contents of a recently unearthed repository classified by the secret government, the Phenomenon Archives. We all want to believe that what we read in the papers is true, yet each of us has had to come to terms with the fact that things aren't always as they seem. Today we're going to visit the site of the U.S. partnership with Russia in the International Space Station, Freedom. A worthy endeavor, of course, but at what cost? Stay with us. stood for a cause. Then came new leaders with plans for the masses. A knife in the back and one roll of gauze. When it goes down, put it up. Versus space program. When it goes down, put it up. And space is the inescapable challenge to all the advanced nations of the Earth and who established the United States as the preeminent space-faring nation. First for the coming decade, for the 1990s space station freedom, and next for the new century, back to the moon, back to the future, and this time back to stay. The Soviet space program single-handedly changed the course of history propelling civilization into the greatest era of achievement ever known. With a workforce of over one million people and a virtually unlimited budget, this organization set the standard for space exploration during the height of the Cold War, leaving the Western world in its dust. In today's Russia, the once mighty Soviet space program is in a complete shambles a toppling Goliath whose atomic science and rocket technology are being put under the hammer, available at auction to the highest bidder. Teetering on the edge of a mass exodus are the many underemployed and unpaid rocket and nuclear scientists capable of building weapons of mass destruction. Out of necessity, these very able men and women are forced to consider propositions from unfriendly nations like Libya, Iraq and Iran, each offering millions to secure their services. When it goes down, put it up. You've heard about the delays, you've read about the cost overruns, but what is the actual extent of the problems encountered during the construction of the International Space Station? Where does the official story end and the truth begin. Billions upon billions of dollars lost, pilfered, or squandered on faulty workmanship and parts. If there ever was a story that was intended to be buried, it's this one. Luckily, because of the recent unearthing of the Phenomenon Archives, government had no place to hide its guilty secret. When we are talking about the current uh, situation in the Russian space research and space industry, it's the same as the old Russian economy. It's declining, and uh, I can uh, use the word dying. And if it will be not special intensive care, it will die. Perhaps with the best political intentions, the American executive branch has initiated a high-tech drama, drawing an unwitting NASA and the American taxpayer into a convoluted welfare program designed to keep Russia's nuclear scientists and engineers 
working on peaceful projects. 95 percent uh, uh, of uh, Russian space industry, of all the institutions, design, bureau infrastructure, is uh, uh, doing nothing, is idling. Whatever they get from the government, because most of it, uh, most of this activity is not in private sector, is uh, like, uh, you know, very modest welfare. Inadvertently, at the center of this very secret American effort is one of the greatest creative enterprises ever attempted by a consortium of international governments, the construction of the International Space Station. Originally designed to be the most illustrious man-made project since the pyramids, the space station has undergone redesign after redesign to compensate for the ongoing hemorrhage of money to the Russians. Tragically, the once great dream of a glorious space outpost has turned into little more than an ineffectual orbiting laughing stock. The state of the Russian space program, from our standards, is a shambles. And in some ways, you could look at it as a testimony to the incredible talent of the Russian uh, engineers, scientists, and cosmonauts to even have a space program. While at the forefront of rocket technology, the Soviets are first to put a satellite into Earth orbit, first to send probes to the moon, Mars, and Venus, first to send a man into space, first to conduct a spacewalk, first to put a three-man crew into space, and the first to put a manned space station into orbit. Though they lose the race to the moon, the Russians continue to pioneer space station technology through the 1970s and 80s. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. When we beat them to the moon, they took a different direction. And they began to think in terms of long-term missions. Uh, they began their exceptional work with space stations. But their program was an end in itself. There was never any pragmatic use for it, other than defense. In 1986, the Soviets complete construction of the Mir, large and complex with its many separate modules, designed for extended space exposure and experimentation, it represents the ultimate accomplishment in space station technology. Soviet space officials designed the Mir station to last only five years, confident they will build their next generation space station by the end of Mir's life in 1991. In uh, 1991, it was still the Soviet Union. I can recall going to Star City for the 30th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's flight, how things had changed. I'm sitting in an amphitheater with cosmonauts and astronauts. We have a society called the Association of Space Explorers. And I'm sitting next to Alexei Leonov, who was the first man to walk in space. I sneezed. And Alexei said, God bless you. Can you say God bless you? I thought all the cosmonauts couldn't believe in God. Soon we can. <laughs> that August, it came apart. It became Russia. With the collapse of communism and the disintegration of the Soviet Union, economic hardships begin to seriously undermine the entirety of Russia, bringing the already struggling space program to its knees. Though Soviet scientists continue to work through untold hardship, their support in government wanes, and the political scene in Russia becomes dangerously unstable. One of the driving factors in the space program was the Western Bloc competing with the Eastern Bloc to prove technical superiority. We showed our national will and our macho by having the strongest space program. We beat the Russians to the moon. We wanted to beat the Russians everywhere across the cosmos. But when the Berlin Wall came down, everything changed. 
At that time, scientists on both sides uh, had a rather naive idea that if there would be no Cold War, uh, we could come together and we will get all the money which were wasted for military budgets of uh, uh, both uh, superpowers. So now Cold War is over and uh, uh, we do not see such phenomena. We do not see peace dividends uh, for a new really outstanding space project. Gone are the days of the million man staff. Gone are the days of the billion dollar budget. But worse, the Russian space program must endure a split in public support. Russian efforts in outer space become a symbol for many of the old Soviet empire. This memory is weighted with anguish, suffering, and cultural deprivation. With less than nothing to fall back on, Associated scientists and physicists seek desperately to supplement their sagging wages through whatever means available as the space program spirals down into a state of utter bankruptcy. With the Russian economy in ruins, what consequences are being felt by other members of the space station partnership? Boeing, the largest private aerospace company in the U.S., recently canceled its development of the commercial supersonic airplane because they lost NASA as a financial partner. Hundreds of space and technology jobs have been sacrificed at NASA alone. But why? Why have a space program at all if your resources are so limited? Well, we are talking about uh, how people survived there. Of course, it's impossible to survive if you will think only about your salary, because in many cases they're not paying salaries for months and years. It's not only in the space, it is in the all research. I know my, one my friend, he's in the computer science and he has six jobs. Some scientists are uh, using their private cars to look for uh, passengers, ac accidental customers during night times. And uh, that's a big issue, how scientists are, or, or engineers can survive in this uh, economic climate. I know of one story that of a uh, Russian scientist, and he was a leading life scientist expert. And he always has a very good tan. And when you think of a very good tan in the United States, you're thinking, well, this guy's, you know, where they get up. He's out, you know, on the Riviera, or, you know, he's going down to Odessa, and he's getting his tan because he's so in such a prestigious position that he has the money to do such a thing. Uh, in reality, he gets his tan because he has to grow his own vegetables, because he does not get paid from his government. And so instead of spending all of his time uh, working you know, in life sciences, he is growing turnips, hoeing turnips and uh, keeping care of, taking care of his garden so that uh, he can feed himself and his family. The recent joke uh, from Russia, it's, it's uh, Mr. Chubais, uh, who was a, a chief government operator, was briefing Yeltsin about the state of Russian science. He said, you know, Mr. President, uh, I'm surprised. We do not uh, pay them salaries on time, do not uh, support their research, but these guys are coming to their uh, laboratories every day. So after a pause, the president said, maybe we should charge money for that. The Russians launched a supply ship to Mir, and the cosmonauts were on board. And when the ship actually docked with the Mir, and the cosmonauts opened up the packages, they realized that a significant portion of the food was missing. Apparently what happened, was that underpaid or unpaid workers at the space complex had actually pilfered the rations because they had not received pay for the work that they had been doing over the past six months to a year. Russia maintains the mirror for nearly 10 years beyond its intended lifespan, harvesting hundreds of millions of dollars in rent from foreign space programs with their own scientific interests. When the aging space laboratory begins to falter, NASA and other tenants of the Mir 
fearful of potential space disasters, discontinue their missions to the orbiter. Rental payments for use of Mir come to an abrupt end, compounding the space program's financial woes. Without this financial support to continue its upkeep, the Mir's fate seems sealed. The Russians, forever attempting to generate new money around their expired resources, argue that the ailing space station is invaluable to the process of constructing the new International Space Station. There was a moment when uh, Russian authorities, uh, on an uh, informal level, in uh, testing uh, the uh, waters, uh, tried, uh, desperately tried uh, to suggest uh, to use the current Mir station as an early outpost for future International Space Station. It was rejected. I, I don't think it was a good idea. It's not uh, good to start a new car uh, implanting the old, uh, ancient engine. One story indicative of the extent of despair unfolds when two cosmonauts landing to refuel at an Air Force base are held at gunpoint by military police and prevented from taking off until the pilots can pay in cash for their aviation fuel. Accounts of looting by space program workers are also reported at the International Space Station launch site in Baikonur. Certain factions of the, of the workers get paid a little bit and other factions don't and unfortunately this tends to be along racial lines. And there have been riots that have occurred. Uh, buildings have been burned down, people have been killed. The selling off of rocket parts has become commonplace amongst employees of Baikonur. Russia's Cape Canaveral, this is the chosen launch site of the International Space Station. Not wanting to miss out on any opportunity for financial gain, the Russian government itself participates in this mass sell-off of space program inventories. We're not only seeing this happen with the space program, we're actually seeing this happen in the military where one of the generals recently was indicted for trying to sell a troop carrier to Spain. As a last resort, the Russians enter into partnerships with foreign corporations, hoping that a quick influx of cash will deliver them from their most immediate needs. One of the great economic opportunities that some of the American aerospace companies have taken advantage of is funding the Russian rocket companies, the Russian aerospace companies making these boosters, providing them with a steady supply of capital so that they can actually stay, they can actually have a budget, that they can actually get parts, that they can actually pay their workers. Partnerships with foreign investors provide a band-aid for some of the short-term issues faced by the Russians. Damaged infrastructure and out-of-date inventories require much larger cash infusions. The monies provided by foreign interests may simply be establishing a false sense of security in an industry where mistakes invariably cost lives. The Russian boosters have had a long tradition of being remarkably robust and remarkably dependable. Unfortunately, these Russian boosters have had an unfortunate string of accidents. And primarily, these accidents are related to a uh, lack of money, scrounging for parts, scavenging parts to put together a booster that is going to be complete. The secrecy surrounding the Soviet space program is historically infamous. As a branch of the military, mistakes were covered up to preserve political image. In our review of the Kremlin archives, we discovered an extensive list of deaths related to accidents occurring over the space of the program's 40 years, and this when budgets were high. All of these red flags flapping in the breeze, and yet we move forward with the Russians. Why? During the planning stages of the International Space Station, many accomplished representatives from the American space program speak out against including the Russians as a primary partner. It is believed that their involvement will hopelessly inflate the budget while delaying construction for months, if not years. If at any time in the mission, however, the limb had separated, Despite the urgings of officials like Dr. Chris Kraft, 
former director of NASA's Johnson Space Center, the American government pressures NASA into bringing the Russians on board. NASA officials plainly object. There have been several administrations asked the Johnson Space Center, I'm talking about political administrations, that asked us what benefit is there for us to gain from working and flying with the Russians. And we always sent back a great big zero. Finally, after the urgings of the executive branch proved insufficient motivation to align NASA with the American government's agenda, the United States leadership orders its space agency to form the partnership regardless of the expense. Several other countries join the uneasy partnership with Russia, steadfastly committing to complete the new International Space Station by the early 21st century. The spectrum of political problems surrounding the project confound many members of the partnership. The Russians suffer new waves of economic turmoil. Their budgetary commitments fall well short of contractual obligations. Without the influx of Russian funding, many on the American side question what benefits, if any, the United States will derive from the completed space station. Former United States Senator and Apollo 17 moonwalker, Dr. Harrison Schmidt. And a great deal of the effort is going in to try to make it an international space station, rather than one which uh, the United States might find uh, quite functional for its own purposes. Uh, we often forget we already had a space station. Uh, Skylab uh, in the uh, 70s was a tremendously capable space station. Uh, we learned a great deal there. And in fact, it's going to be a long time before the, uh, the space station that's under construction right now uh, even comes close to matching what was possible and what, indeed what was done with Skylab uh, back in the 70s. And we should actually be calling the International Space Station what it is, which is not really science. We know pretty much what we need to know from our own previous work about the long-term effects of space, space habitation. What the International Space Station program ought to be called is a, an effort to aid Soviet and Russian science in sectors where we feel the non-military character has to be increased and the military character has to be d d diminished. Now, if you've got political reasons for doing it and you want to, that's part of the game plan of, of international cooperation and that's a good thing to do and you want to keep the uh, Russian scientists inside of Russia instead of letting them the brain drain leave Russia, that's your problem. You tell us you want us to do that, then by gosh, we will do that when you tell us to do it and we can do it and we will do it. But don't ask us, is there anything to be gained from a technical point of view and from a NASA point of view in working with the Russians? The answer is no. Several domestic and international security and defense agencies report that a number of oil-rich nations, such as Libya, Iraq, and Iran, are soliciting the services of Russian scientists. By offering millions in salaries and benefits, these countries seek to develop nuclear capabilities and ballistic weaponry with the help of the technical expertise of these accomplished men and women. For very real and uh, reasons, uh, people are concerned about keeping the uh, scientists and engineers of the Soviet Union employed in peaceful activities rather than possibly many of them going to the highest bidder uh, for uh, not so peaceful activities, particularly in the more terrorist oriented states of the, of the world, where, the, uh, where they could contribute to the development of nuclear and biological and chemical weapons. This prospect is unthinkable to the U.S. and its other partners. The executive branch positions itself to prevent this mass exodus. The International Space Station is established as the flow-through project for funding the needs of Russian rocket scientists and engineers to ensure that their special talents remain in Russia. That is an admirable uh, goal. However, the amount of money that the space station can contribute uh, and that NASA can contribute to that effort is very small compared to what's probably needed. 
The unwitting victims of this affair are, once again, the American taxpayers. Never informed by their government that the space station partnership is, in reality, a foreign aid project, they are duped into believing that the financial burden is to be shared largely with the Russians. For their part, the Russians never have any intention of honoring their contractual obligation to be equal partners, either financially or technologically. The cost sharing was one of the original justifications for bringing Russia uh, and other nations into it. But in the case of Russia, it, it has not worked out. In fact, uh, Russia's participation is costing us uh, much more money now uh, than we uh, might have saved uh, had they even performed well. Uh, and and it's, just a different, it's just a different game. The Russians were not prepared uh, politically or, uh, or technologically or uh, uh, economically in order uh, to participate in the space station program. And we, we knew that. Uh, and many people predicted that this is what was going to happen, and indeed their predictions have come true. In its last cooperative effort, Russia partnered in the design and launch of an unmanned probe to Mars. An ominous signal of coming events, one of the probe's scavenged rockets fails to ignite, and the German finance multi-million dollar probe burns up in the Earth's atmosphere. Despite this and other costly Russian failures, the United States enters into and continues to sustain the partnership with regular infusions of hundreds of millions of American dollars. They even redesigned the project to fit some of the more antiquated technical processes still employed by the Russians. Despite the special provisions, exceptions, and dispensations made on their behalf, the Russians prove impossible partners attempting by every means to escape their contractual obligations. Russia, according to International Division of Labor, is responsible for delivering to orbit of two early modules. The first outpost uh, uh, module, which is called uh, FGB, uh, is built under contract given by NASA. The second module, uh, so-called service model uh, is uh, under construction as a Russian contribution uh, to uh, International Space Station. And uh, this is clearly underfunded. And this is uh, one of the major issues uh, uh, debated between Russian government and U.S. government. Uh, all the uh, international participants of uh, Space Station are quite unhappy with the delays uh, uh, in Russia. Right now, they're angry at us and we're angry at them. It actually has produced the opposite result that we were seeking. We were trying to create a collaborative, cooperative, joint venture you know, on a grand scale with U.S. taxpayer money subsidizing the process. And what it became was a source of great friction and tension and a lot of conflict. And I think if the Russian Space Agency staff could vote, they would probably vote that NASA goes away. But they can't because, A, it's not a democratic system, and B, that's what's keeping them afloat. Frustrated NASA officials know full well that the International Space Station could have been completed on time and on budget, according to its original illustrious specifications, had the Russians not been involved. Their frustration is compounded by the fact that the space station being built presents little potential for groundbreaking scientific work. The leadership of the American government maintains its stalwart commitment to sponsor the Russians' decrepit space program. From missed deadlines to inferior construction, virtually every aspect of Russia's participation in the effort proves inferior. This is not stopping their space officials from making additional demands for cash, as in desperation they hold the space station hostage an additional 660 million American dollars are committed by the U.S., supplementing the 700 million already shoveled gratuitously in Russia's direction. With all of the political rhetoric about government spending and cost control, why haven't the floodgates been closed? With every conspiracy, there's a winner and a loser, and we already know who the loser is, the taxpayer. 
But who wins in a situation like this? Certainly, the gun-running activities of Iran-Contra were a far more dastardly and contemptible example of government conspiracy, as was the Reagan administration's blatant bypassing of Congress and utter disregard for the American Constitution. Past wrongs, however, do not sanction continued abuse of power. Even so, the executive branch continues to defraud the American taxpayer, authorizing billions in payments to the Russians under the pretense of their essential participation in the partnership. The American Congress, long concerned over NASA being turned into a de facto foreign relations branch of the government, stands idly by. Apparently, the political challenge of cutting funding to the popular space station project is too great. Why rock the boat when this funding can be so easily justified behind the pretense of limiting nuclear capabilities around the world? They did not expect that the state of Russian economy would deteriorate to such a degree. Whatever is going to happen to the economy uh, would provide an answer of uh, where Russian space is going uh, uh, in future. If economy would stagnate like today, uh, space station would be the last page in the Russian space program. And I happen to think that the International Space Station so far is a program that's gone bad because we operated as though the Russian space agency was just like any other contractor, when in fact it's a totally different animal that we don't even begin to understand. The way that they make decisions, the way that they finance their programs, the way that they set priorities, the way that they govern themselves, we have no idea how that works. It's a very circuitous, very convoluted, frankly not very logical system of priorities and, and decisions. I don't think we're very good at getting a grasp on it. With the president and the vice president forcefully endorsing the Russian partnership on one side and Congress tightening the reins of government subsidy on the other, NASA finds itself entangled in a Gordian knot of partisan politics. After surviving catastrophes like the explosion of the Challenger and the rescue of Apollo 13, this groundbreaking innovative civilian organization credited with the most important technological breakthroughs of the century has become a pawnbroker to the Russians. Despite this, NASA continues to repurpose dated technology and to work with an unmanageably corrupt system to somehow install a bottom on the bottomless pit that is the Russian space program. Struggling mightily to keep the president happy by continuing to fund the Russian effort, NASA is forced to fight Congress for every dollar it receives. Ultimately, something must give. NASA is forced to redesign the space station, lowering its overall cost through compromising the final product. It is this series of redesigns that virtually eliminates any potential for important scientific work. We're still pickering about a space station. The space station has gone from a Taj Mahal to an outhouse. And uh, it's an outhouse in orbit, that's about it. Right now, it appears that uh, uh, those dollars that are being sent to the former Soviet Union, namely ru primarily Russia, uh, to uh, ensure their participation in the space station uh, may have been largely wasted. And so uh, that's the kind of thing you get into when you make your space program primarily an instrument of the State Department. If you're going to have a federal governmental space program, it should be in and of itself for its own purposes. NASA is about the future. NASA is about rewriting physics textbooks and biology and chemistry textbooks. NASA is about understanding where new sources of energy could come from and how matter gets formed. NASA is about understanding who are we and what are we and how do we relate to our universe. NASA is about understanding our universe and solar system to better understand our own planet. NASA is about trying to understand how we could make long-term predictive models of our weather and our climate so we could avoid disasters, natural disasters. You know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, right? I mean, there is a lot of bad in anything. And I, we are, you know, I'm, I'm a super critical person when I talk to my colleagues about it, but I don't go out and tell the world that NASA's doing all the wrong things. I mean, Mr. Golan is doing the best he can. Under the circumstances, he, he wouldn't have a space program if he didn't do what he's doing. 
And I would say in answer to that, so what? Don't do it. It could have been more. It could have been a project focused on developing the, the human uh, understanding, uh, physiological understanding of human beings, uh, some of the technologies necessary, as well as how to build things with indefinite life uh, for use in space. All of those things are important to going back to the moon and to Mars and on out into outer space. But that is not the purpose of today's space station. There'll be some indirect fallout. Uh, and valuable uh, technologies to come out of it, but it's not the primary thrust of that. Unless we call it what it is, we're perpetuating the kind of lie which is a little bit similar to what we saw in the 60s. I mean, it's not like we're covering up massive catastrophe, malfeasance, or other kinds of errors. Um, here, we're just basically trying to gloss over the true story, which is that the Russian science program particularly space science, is on its knees, and that we don't want somebody else getting access to it because it has the potential to be used for weapons of mass destruction. I think if we called it that, we'd be a lot clearer about our goals. Why hide the truth and the evidence from the people of the world? Well, the fact is that this kind of government suppression is not without precedent. Through the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the Soviet government grossly exaggerated the accomplishments of its space program. It distorted reality by covering up its setbacks and preventing public recognition of its cosmonauts, scientists, and engineers. This systematic lie to itself, its people, and to the world has sent the Russian space program reeling to the point where it is now living in the light of its own shadow. If the American government insists on relegating NASA to the role of political attaché, while simultaneously lying to the American public about the true nature of the space station partnership, NASA and the U.S. can expect little more than a place alongside the Russians in infamy. The reality is that there is a chronic problem in Russian official organizations in owning up to the truth. And the most recent financial crisis in August of 98 in Russia, which practically saw the demise of the Russian economy as we know it, and came very close to a meltdown, uh, that was due to systematic lying, Yeltsin to himself not telling the truth, Yeltsin and his cabinet not talking the truth to each other, the bankers in the West not wanting to see the truth of the situation in Russia, and it really has dramatic implications. I mean, we fundamentally may get burned in a global economic sense because of the way the Russians deal with the truth. How does the U.S. government deal with the truth? Humanity may be in danger should Russian rocket scientists move to unfriendly nations to create weapons of mass destruction. But how will the fallout resulting from blatant governmental misrepresentation affect us? With the clearest historical example of where a policy of deceit in government leads, the Soviet Empire lays prostrate before us, drowning in a sea of economic turmoil. Rather than learn from these mistakes, the leadership of the United States government seems determined to repeat the same grave errors. The creation of the International Space Station is a foreign aid program for the Russians, a charitable contribution made by the American taxpayer to the Russian space program, a division of the Russian military. The price tag is T minus two billion dollars and counting. The judgment of those who would preserve a policy of deception at the expense of the International Space Station, intended to be the greatest collaborative creation since the pyramid, begs the question, why must the U.S. use the same deceitful methods employed by the Soviets during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s? We're confronted once again with a larger and perhaps more pressing question. How do we respond when our government, be it local, state, or federal, turns a blind eye toward and even becomes a party to corruption? Soviet science and Russian science is not going to go away. Russians are going to be as oriented toward the basic 
and frontier sciences as they have ever been, especially once their economy begins to recover. The question we have to ask is whether or not there will be a political system in place which is democratically oriented and which is open to inputs and criticisms from the outside that will ensure that we don't get into the kind of systematic lying and cover-up that seems to have been the case in the 60s and the 70s and even into the late 80s. Is the program on the verge of extinction of collapse? Probably is from our perspective, but from the Russian perspective, they will probably be able to keep it going for enough years until somehow enough capital is infused into the country. They're still printing money. They're uh, still producing a lot of vodka. Some of it is uh, of international quality. They still export a uh, lot of oil and gas to foreign countries. But uh, uh, the fate of scientific community, of the research community, is uh, really very ugly. So all this uh, Russian uh, legacy, or Soviet legacy, uh, now is going to be kept uh, in Aeros in Space Museum uh, here, and uh, perhaps in a few scattered exhibitions in Russia. Much like its Soviet counterpart did throughout the last four decades, NASA is falling victim to the political machinations of its sponsoring government. Created and maintained as a civilian agency dedicated to the science of space, NASA has led our world in one of its greatest eras of achievement. Since its inception, it has performed most exceptionally when it has been left to do what it does best. We must, in the United States, look at our national priorities first. But after we define national priorities, we certainly can cooperate. And if we want our children to live in a world that doesn't have the tremendous number of wars and killing that we've had in this last century. Working in space helps build bridges and break down lack of understanding among people. And so long as we put our national priorities first, we'll have lots of room to work together. If the U.S. government continues along its present course, using NASA as a go-between with the Russians, one of America's greatest assets may be undermined by lies. If history is any indication of where this path leads, NASA could soon be following in the footsteps of its Russian counterpart. Broke, dishonored, distrusted, and ultimately dismembered. Recounting the lessons of history from the long neglected stories of tragedy and intrigue. These are the Phenomenon Archives, what you've never seen and what you're not supposed to know. I'm Dean Stockwell. Thanks for tuning in. We once were a country of respect and power, a nation of people that stood for a cause. Then came new leaders with plans for the masses, a knife in the back and one roll of gauze. When it goes down, put it up for sale. Like national pride. When it goes down, put it up for sale. Divide the republic and sell the remains. Politics dead, now money's the game. They steal from the people with no threat of jail. Just find what is failing, put it up. When it goes down, put it up for sale. Space program! When it goes down, put it up for sale. Say